At the time of Jesus' birth, there was a man named Simeon who followed God closely and devoted himself to God's ways. He knew of God's promise to one day send a Messiah to rescue Israel, and he waited and hoped for this to happen. God's Spirit revealed to Simeon that he would not die before he saw the Messiah himself. Simeon was moved by what God's Spirit told him, so he went to the temple. As he stood in the outer courts of the temple, he saw Joseph and Mary bring their young child, Jesus, into the temple. They were there to offer a sacrifice, a pair of doves or pigeons, in order to consecrate Jesus to God. Simeon took the child into his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. Mary and Joseph marveled over what Simeon said about their young child, Finally, Simeon blessed Mary and Joseph as well. Just as God had promised to him, Simeon had seen the Messiah with his own eyes. Good morning. Welcome to New Hope Church. It is great to have you with us today. If you are visiting for your very first time, it's great to have you here. There are some uh, Vista communication cards in the pew right in front of you. I would love for you to take one, fill it out, drop it in the offering bag. Next week through the mail, we'll send you some information that tells you about New Hope. We promise we will not beat on your door or bother you on the phone. So I'd uh, love for you to fill that out. Those cards are also there for our regular church family. If you have prayer requests, messages to the staff, please use them. Drop it in the offering bag, and we will attend to those as quickly as we possibly can. Let me highlight a few announcements, then I have some updates of prayer requests that are not in your bulletin, and uh, then we will get engaged in our worship. First off, if you are visiting with us for the very first time and you have kids in our children's ministries, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, not that we have a sorry children's ministry, it's just I'm sorry it's a mess right now. We are in the midst of remodeling, and in a month, uh, it will be the best it has ever been around New Hope. So we are very, very excited about that. The First building out front next to the playground we refer to around here is the Murbach building. It's named after a couple that were part of the foundation of this church, and he actually built the buildings here. And so the Murbach building is being completely renovated inside. And uh, when you show up with your kids in about three to four weeks to check them in, you will not meet out in the cold in the pavilion. You will go through a set of nice new double doors, and there will be a large spacious room for you and your kids to, uh, uh, to get them registered and get their name tags on them. And from that room, if your kid is in pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, toddler, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, you will see all the doors from right where you're standing. So one room for all kids except nursery, all right, will be in the Murgbot building, and they are going to be done beautifully. So we're excited. Thank you for some of the volunteers who came and helped the contractors this week and every bit that you can volunteer for. Uh, when we are at moments where volunteers are helpful, uh, that just saves us a little money, and saving money is really good as we get ready for the next part of our expansion. So uh, just we apologize for the mess, but before Easter, it is going to be up and running, and we are very excited about that. Let me also make a special welcome to the Actus family. Would you stand? All of you are not here, but Matt and Shelly and the girls. All right. Come on, girls. All right. Welcome home. Welcome home. Uh, they have spent four plus years in Colombia, and uh, they are arriving here by way of Colombia after spending about two months in Africa. And uh, so we'll be excited. We're getting together this week, and uh, we'll set a time in which they can share with all of us the new adventure that God has in store for them. Uh, and we believe it will be on the continent of Africa. And so uh, we're excited to hear all that. But welcome to them today. It's good to have them home. Uh, next Sunday, March the 1st, first Sunday of the month, is our Homeless Outreach Sunday. Uh, so all of you who are regular participants, you know the, sto uh, the story. If you've never been on a Homeless Outreach, it's about a two and a half hours out of your Sunday afternoon 
right after the 1045 service at about 1215, they meet over in the other building, prepare lots of sack lunches and other items to give away. Then they carpool down to an area in south, uh, southwest Fresno, and uh, they get engaged in ministry by giving food and cold water and necessary items, and we do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, March the 5th is Celebrate Recovery's sixth anniversary. That's a Thursday night, and so uh, whether you're a regular participant in Celebrate Recovery or not, uh, it's a great night to come out, learn more about Celebrate Recovery, be involved in a celebration. Uh, 6.30, right here in the sanctuary, uh, they will have their celebration. You will hear some testimonies. You will have their worship team here leading in music, and it's always a great night. Anything else I need to tell them? 5.30 barbecue. What you barbecuing? No ribeyes? <laughs> um, hamburgers and hot dogs barbecue at 5.30 and the celebration in here at 6.30 and they would love to have you. It's open to everybody. Uh, on March the 7th, it is cleaning and maintenance day around New Hope. Spring cleaning time, 7 in the morning till about noon. Uh, if you can come help, whether it's inside or outside, uh, we try to clean everything from top to bottom. And um, I know in the past a couple of gentlemen have had uh, spray rigs you know, behind a small tractor and you can spray all the weeds. If, if anybody can do that like the next week so that they would all be dead in two weeks, that would be great. So then we could clean them all out, all right? Uh, so that would be great. So if you're able to do that, just call the office. That would be absolutely wonderful. And uh, by the way, Cleaning and Maintenance Day is, um, is um, uh, it's an equal opportunity day, okay? Uh, men, women, Young, middle-aged, walking, uh, it's, 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 all, it's all good, okay? It is all good that day. So many hands make light work on that day. Um, just a heads up, uh, the following day, uh, daylight savings time kicks in. So the night when you go to bed on March the 7th, uh, if you don't change your clock, okay, you will be a little late for the 915 service and a little early for the 1045 service, all right? So don't forget, it springs forward. You will lose an hour of sleep, all right? And it's okay if you catch up at church. It's happened before. <laughs> Financial Peace University Bible Study will also start Sunday night, March the 8th, and Grief Share uh, is going to kick off on Wednesday night, March the 4th. So a couple of highlights. Please put on your calendar March 15th, one of the biggest events of our church every year. It is our annual pie auction. It is our fundraiser for our high school kids going to Mexico on their mission project. We ask you to bring your best homemade dessert or your best homemade dish, all right? Uh, we don't mind main dishes as well as desserts, all right? We're usually hungry after it's over. Uh, uh, you, you, you make it, you bake it, you bring it, we sell it, you buy it, okay? That's the way it works here. And we usually raise between ten dollars and $15,000 at that event. All right, so we hope you'll come out and join us that night. We'll say more about that a little bit later. Uh, all right, that takes care of the announcements, except for if we have some strong, able-bodied men after this service is over, meet Mark Addis. Now that they're both in church, I'm going to have to really work. I got Matt Actis and Mark Addis, all right? Um, uh, there are some things that we need to move because of construction out into storage sheds, and uh, since Mark is married to Jennifer, who's in charge of children's ministry, he got the job. Um, so if you, can, if you can assist Mark, he'll meet you over inside, or where, where do you want to meet? Okay, he'll meet you at the storage unit, okay? So if you can help right after the service for about 15 or 20 minutes, that would be great. Um, a few prayer requests. Just was handed a note, Hazel Wright has bronchitis. That's why, that's why her husband looks lonely sitting there on the pew today, all right? But um, please be praying for Hazel. She gets better soon. Janet Matson had knee surgery two weeks ago. Uh, Ruth Lovick, Jesse's wife, who has been homebound for the last several months, uh, has been moved to a care home uh, right on the edge of Clovis just yesterday afternoon. She is now under hospice care. So if you'd be remembering to pray for Jesse and for Ruth, they would appreciate that so much. Janet Perfora had surgery this week at a heart hospital. Uh, Stephanie, who works with our kids on Wednesday nights, uh, uh, had a procedure this week, and the good news is she's doing fine, all right? And so we're grateful for the outcome of those tests. 
Uh, Mary Den Hartog had successful cataract surgery this week, and so for that we are also very grateful. Several families just to continue to pray for, for God's encouragement, strength, and, uh, and comfort in their lives. This was a very busy week around New Hope. Um, please remember the Hartwig family, Floyd and Vi. They were married 67 years, and they passed away the same day. And um, it, it, is a, it is a notebook story, all right? It really is. Um, they both were under hospice care, and the morning that they passed away, uh, Floyd asked the nurse if he would push his bed over next to Vi's. He wanted to hold her hand. And about half an hour later, he passed away. And five hours later, she joined him. And so uh, do remember the Hartwig family. Uh, though, the, as, as, the, as the boy said, we have no complaints. Mom and Dad had a full, long life together. Uh, Orin Paris, that was a service also early in the week, if you remember the Paris family. Aaron Stonehouse service was here yesterday. Aaron's a 34-year-old former Buchanan student, baptized her here when she was 16. And uh, she passed away in December, but they, the service was yesterday. So if you would just remember the Stonehouse. And then how many of you remember Harpane's Dairy? Hey, remember the fruit punch or the chocolate milk? Yeah, for those of you who like chocolate, I hate chocolate, so I never got the milk, but I did get the red fruit punch. Uh, it dawned on me, probably every wedding I went to in the late 60s and early 70s served Harpane's Red Punch, all right? That was the popular thing. Well, the last of the Harpane sons passed away this week. His name was Elmer. If you'd remember them, uh, they would appreciate it. There is one uh, Harpane daughter from the original family that started the dairy there uh, who was still living here in the area, but uh, they would appreciate it. And then from our own church family, uh, Gino Leonardo. This one caught us all by surprise. Uh, Georgia's here, and so good morning, Georgia. You are an incredible trooper. God, God's strength has been evident in you, and it's good to see your family with you. Um, Gene and I had a chance to visit with Gino last Sunday, and uh, neither one of us, I think, thought that Monday would be his going home day. Uh, he was in a rare form and rousing discussion, and, and um, yet his time was on Monday, and so that service was yesterday afternoon. So if you would remember to pray for Georgie and for Andy and for Errol and the rest of their family, they would appreciate that so very much, and special thanks to... Uh, their small group and other ladies in the church who, along with Tarpey Elementary, helped host a reception at their home late yesterday afternoon and early evening. So thank you for all that you did this week, yesterday here, getting ready for these services. Um, with all the remodel, it's a bit challenging, but you all made it easy. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. At this time, I'm going to... Oh, one more thing I wanted to do. I'll do this now instead of in the sermon time. Uh, most of you know I've been carrying this old beat-up Bible around since January of this year, and I'll, I'll get to put it back on the shelf and go back to my other Bible after this week. But uh, this was sort of a nostalgic. I can tell I'm getting older. I'm getting more nostalgic. Um, this Bible made it all the way to the Ivory Coast and back. And, and, and the reason is it's because an important date, an important anniversary, uh, was met while I was in Ivory Coast. Um, this is the Bible that was given to me when I was 10 years old. And uh, it is the Bible that I was carrying on February the 8th, 1970, which is the night that I realized God had called me to preach. And I announced that in a Sunday evening service on February the 8th. And so on February the 8th in Ivory Coast of Africa, I had this with me. Today is an anniversary date for two things. Uh, one, on this Sunday night, uh, 45 years ago, I preached my first sermon, okay, um, it was 12 minutes long. <laughs> there hasn't been another one quite like that one, all right, since then. 8 o'clock service did end early today, all right, just, just I'll point that out. Um, and, and, and so that's one of the reasons I carried this is just in celebration of that anniversary 45 years ago. And um, the other thing is, is five years ago tonight, is when we had the celebration of life for my mother. She had passed away on February the 13th, and on the Sunday night of uh, this day, uh, we celebrated Mom's homegoing. So this is a special nostalgic day for me for a couple of very important reasons. So God has been so gracious over the last 45 years, and you have been so gracious for the last 22 years. Thanks for being here. I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our tithes and offering. Let's pray. 
Father, for the life that you share with us, we are most grateful. It is beyond my ability to comprehend what it would be like to face life by myself. To face the challenges and the circumstances of life, the struggles with health, the struggles at times financially, the struggles with emotions, the struggles with family relationships, the struggles with death. To, to face all of those things in the adventuresome daily living of life would seem unbearable. If it wasn't for the fact that we can have a relationship with someone who is bigger than all of those things. That relationship doesn't mean we avoid all of those things, but it means we have someone bigger than ourselves to walk with us through them. So we say thanks. We're so grateful for your availability to meet so many needs this week, the needs of all of these families who there is now a, an absent place in a home, there is an absent place at a table, there's an absent place in plans and thoughts for the future. And you have been available to bring comfort, to offer hope, so that we don't say goodbye, I'll probably never see you again, but we say so long, can't wait to see you soon. Father, for the strength you provide in some of those who've been going through cancer treatment and surgeries, two women in our 8 o'clock service who are both just thriving, their, their, their heads are bald but their smiles are bright and they're saying God has been so good to give them strength that why should we worry? One of them said to me this morning, Tim, if I get to live a little longer, it's great and if I don't, that's even better. And I thought, wow, she gets it. She understands a life with faith with you. May her tribe increase. May her influence abound in the lives of others. Thank you today for the privilege of giving and sharing. You have been so gracious to us. We give back, Father, as a testimony of your sufficiency in our lives. Lord, you know the needs of those who've gathered. There may be some here for the very first time, and they are in need of hearing both in music and in message about the kind of hope that you offer to us all. And I pray that through the frailty of human lips, the power of your word will be ministered today and lives will be changed. And to you will be the praise and the glory. We say thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. And try to imagine 200 inmates who have experienced that change, all right, at that stage in life getting excited about that because they found themselves in the most hopeless of situations, a prison cell. And when Jesus entered their life, he done changed them, and they now have hope. Incredible experience. A little over a month before he died, the famous atheist John Paul Sartre, as some say, Sartre, he declared that he so strongly resisted feelings of despair that he would say to himself, I know I shall die in hope. And then in profound sadness, he added, but hope needs a foundation, and I don't have one. The whole letter that was written that's called the book of Hebrews, it often offers encouragement to believers as we are on our Christian journey through life. Knowing that difficulties await at every bend, if you've ever found yourself struggling to keep pressing on as a believer in Jesus Christ, if your life has ever been assaulted by doubts or you have ever been tempted to throw in the towel and give up being a Christian, or maybe you've just become sluggish in responding to the trials and the difficulties of life, then this section of the book of Hebrews that we're going to be looking at today it was tailor-written just for you. The same help and the very same hope that was offered to the original readers of the book of Hebrews is yours and mine as well today. All of us, at some time or another, will find ourselves in need of a stabilizing anchor for our life that enables us to hold on when the storms of life and the rages of trouble of this world plague our souls. I heard of a picture of an old burned out mountain shack. 
All that remained in this picture of the shack was a chimney and the charred debris of what had once been the family's sole possession. In front of this destroyed home stood an old grandfather-looking man dressed only in his underclothes with a small boy clutching a patched pair of overalls. It was evident in the picture that the child was crying. Beneath the picture were the words which the artist felt the old man was speaking to the young boy. They were short and simple words, yet they presented a profound theology and philosophy of life. The words at the bottom of that picture were these, Hush, child. God ain't dead. Hush, child. God ain't dead. The vivid picture of that burned out shack and that old man and weeping child and those words, God ain't dead. Instead of it being a reminder of the despair of life, it has come to be the reminder of hope in life's most desperate moments. And all of us at one time or another are in need of a reminder that there is hope for us. In the midst of all of our failures, in the midst of all of our troubles, we need some mental pictures to remind us that all is not lost as long as God is alive and He is in control of our world. That is what the writer of Hebrews wanted us to know when in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, those verses are found on the first page of, of your chapter in the Believe Bible called Hope, or you can find it in its regular address in your, 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 your regular Bible, Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. The writer wrote these words, we have this hope, not just any hope, he's very specific, we have this hope, and this hope that he's talking about is an anchor for our soul. This anchor for our soul is firm and it is secure and it enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. He's talking about heaven here where our forerunner, the one who's gone before us, Jesus Christ, the one who was born, lived, died, and rose again from the dead because of his finished work, Jesus has entered there already on our behalf. Randy Frazee, the author of this study that we are now 25 out of 30, what would that percentage be? 25 over 30, that is 5 sixth, right? We are 5 sixth of the way through this series. Randy Frazee's mom lives in Cleveland, Ohio. She had a debilitating fear of flying. To visit family that lived out of state, traveling by plane was never an option for her. This all changed, though, when her granddaughter was born in San Antonio, Texas. The only way that Ma Grandma could see her new granddaughter was to fly from Cleveland to Dallas. She summoned all of her courage, and she made the trip so that she could hold her baby girl Jennifer in her arms. You see, the hope of seeing her new grandbaby allowed her to overcome her fear of travel by flying. Because she so desperately wanted to see the other person at the end of her journey. Faith offers us the belief of eternity. But we live in and we are driven by the hope that Jesus is at the other end of our journey. That's what floats my boat. That what, that's what gets me through a week like this past week. I promise you, if it was not for that truth and for that hope, there is no way in the world you would catch me attending six funerals in one week. None. I would avoid every single one of them. But because of a firm belief that Jesus is who He said He was, did what He said He would do, because of the reliability that I have in the truth of this book and the hope that at the other end of this journey, we have hope for those six that death didn't have the last word, but that life does. 
and we have the opportunity to share with folks at a point of desperate need that there is hope. And it is that truth that drives life. So the key question for today is how do we deal with the hardships and the struggles of life? As we look closely at the virtue of hope, it is important to understand clearly what faith is. When we choose to exercise faith, we have no idea of what is coming ahead, but we do believe that God knows. Faith says, God, I will trust you for whatever is in my future. I can't see it, but I believe that you know. One man said it this way, my future might catch me by surprise, but it does not have to catch me unprepared. And it is the exercise of faith in a growing, healthy relationship with Jesus Christ that prepares us for the unexpected, that prepares us for those moments when we are caught by surprise. When we choose to exercise faith and we have no idea of what's coming, but we believe God knows and we trust Him with it, the author of Genesis describes how God worked in Abraham's life and how Abraham responded. Listen to what Genesis 12 verses 1 through 4 says. The Lord said to Abram, leave your home country. Leave your people, your family. Leave your family household and your friends. And head for a land I will show you. Abraham asked a good question. Where am I going? And God said, when you get there, I'll tell you. How many of y'all would head on vacation that way? And this was not a vacation for Abraham. This was a life change. This was going to require faith in a person about circumstances that he couldn't see. Let's read on. God said to Abram, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. You will get blessed and by your blessings you will bless others. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram, what did he do? (laughs) He went as the Lord has told him. Abraham expressed faith. He listened to God and acted on what he was told to do. The author of Hebrews provides this memorable definition of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, 1, one of the verses we learn as kids in a Sunday school class, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. As one other translation renders that same verse, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. If faith begins the journey, then it is hope that ends the journey. Hope is absolutely knowing where the road of faith will end. It is being confident of where the story will conclude. Hope gives us the ability to endure the hardships and difficulties along the road of faith. Please understand, a life of faith does not rid your life of hardships. It just simply prepares you for them. We walk on in the hope of where this road leads. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And when you and I walk on the way of faith in the relationship with Jesus Christ, He has told us where our final destination is. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am one day, you will also be. By faith, we get on the way. And by hope, we arrive in heaven. What's the key idea for today? That we can can experience victory in the hardships of life because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We will just not cope with life, but we can have victory in the midst of the hardships of life because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. That testimony was given to me this morning before I ever preached the first sermon in the 8 o'clock service. When one of the ladies in our 8 o'clock who's been going through treatment for cancer, today's the very first time that she pulled off her hat. She's always had a hat on. Today she had her hat sitting on the table. She was just as bald as a white cue ball, all right, on a pool table. Her head was so smooth, all right, it was so perfect. 
And I said, how you doing? Because she's here every Sunday. She, she, she rarely misses. I said, how you been going through it all? She said, Tim, God's been so gracious. I'm doing fine. She said, but I think most of it is, is the attitude I have because of my faith in Christ. I said, explain that to me. She said, I'm happy with whatever the outcome is going to be. I win both ways. And I said, you get it. Cow, you love that when it happens. See, it's what Paul said. If I live, it's great. I get to keep sharing life here and sharing the testimony of Christ with others. And if I die, I get to go to heaven face to face. It is victory in the tough moments of life because of our faith and hope in Jesus Christ. To better understand biblical hope, we must determine what hope is not. If we live in the hope of our current circumstances... If we live in the hope and the idea that things are going to get better, or, or at least they're going to stay the same, bad idea. Because how many of you have hoped that things would just stay the same, and then they did what? They got worse. I mean, have you ever found your life in the toilet and you didn't think it could get any worse, and then you discovered the septic tank? See, we don't have such guarantees in this world. We can't sustain this kind of hope based on our circumstances. Solomon, the wise man in history, wisely observed that we all get old. There's living truth to that in this room. Hair, teeth, they kind of fall out. Things stop working the way they used to. And eventually, we and the people we love, we all die. As I candidly shared yesterday in Aaron's memorial service, this process just doesn't happen when we're old. And I shared with him that Aaron was 34. She was young, she was bright, she was beautiful, she was intelligent, she was bubbly. And she died. And you will die. And you will die. And you will die. And I will die. That's life. That's what Solomon says. And eventually, it will happen to all of us. Putting our hope in this life leads to colossal disappointments. Solomon called life with no reference to God in the first chapter of Ecclesiastes, verse 14. He defined it this way. Life is meaningless. It is chasing after the wind. And do you ever catch the wind? No. But Christ offers something more, something true, something viable, the hope of eternal life. In his letter to the, to the Romans, Paul writes this in Romans 8, 24 and 25. It is in this hope that we are saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait patiently. As Christians, we must place our hope in the promise of what God has told us will come and the promise that Jesus is on the other side of this life. And the grand bonus is that one day we will be reunited with all those who've gone before us to heaven. We will have the privilege when hope is fulfilled in heaven of saying, Abraham, how did you do it? We'll have the privilege of walking up to Rahab and saying, Rahab, how did you do it? Not the prostitution part, but, you know, the, the, the lineage of Jesus part, all right? We'll be able to sit down with David and say, David, how did you wait so patiently to become king when you had already been anointed, chosen by God, and yet you patiently waited for God's timing rather than your timing? We can talk to Peter and say, Peter... How could you do it? I mean, three times in one night? Peter, how did you deny me that? Three times, really? Well, we could ask him that. And you know what? He'll answer unashamedly because there's no guilt in heaven. I can sit down with my grandpa. Died when I was 10. and Say, Grandpa, what could I have done better? I can sit down with Mom and say thanks. That's our hope. Listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, 15, 51 through 54. Paul says, listen, I'm going to tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. 
what that, that's a nice way of saying not everybody will die. Some of you are saying, Tim, I thought you said all of us would die. Well, hang on, hang on. We will not all die, but as shake, shake, shake tells us, we all will be changed in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last sound of the trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and those who have already died will be raised imperishable. That body which is decayed in the ground, God will speak forth, and they will come out of the grave. There will be a new, viable, real body that you can touch and feel and that moves. It will look like you, but better than you've ever looked. And it will be one that the hair will never fall out and the teeth will never fall out. It will be an imperishable body. We will be changed for the perishable must clothe itself with immortality and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. And is that truth? that gives us great hope in the midst of a world filled with chaos and pain and trouble. Quite frankly, folks, I think the greatest miracle about all that is seeing all the women change their clothes in a twinkling of an eye. That is just going to be amazing how God pulls that one off. Place your hope in what you will experience one day in God's new kingdom, eternal life in the very presence of the Father Himself. This gives us the ability to endure the bumps and the bruises and the brutal temperatures of Ivory Coast Africa along the road of life. The key application, what difference does this make in the way in which we live? Three things. Hope in Christ gives us a different place to look. On a day-to-day basis, we have little choice. We are, we are so um, inundated with images of this physical world. We have bills that need to be paid, problems that need to be solved, people who demand our attention, hope of a future where God already resides, encourages us to keep looking forward, fix our eyes on the prize, not on this world. For the Christian, the best really is yet to come. The author of Hebrews describes how hope gives us a different place to look when in chapter 12, 1 and 2, he says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Number two, hope in Christ gives us a different way to think. Not only a different place to look, but a different way to think. Our minds can be our greatest enemy or our strongest ally. How we think is what we will do and what we will become, so it's important what we put into our mind. And it's why study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Meditate on the words day and night. It's what we put in here that helps direct our attention. Focus on hope for today, our future, and into eternity. Creates an extremely powerful, optimistic, glass-half-full mindset. You got friends that the glass is always half empty? You don't like to hang around with them too often, do you? You love them, but you just soon, a little bit goes a long ways. And if you're one of those that's half empty, think about that. In our mean-spirited, downward-spiraling culture, the person with an attitude of hope and uplifting thoughts will not only be a healthier person, but they will also be instrumental in drawing others to want to know this same Christ that you know. The Apostle Paul describes this different way to think in Colossians 3, 2 when he says, Set your minds on things above, not on things of this world. And hope in Christ, number three, gives us a different life to live. Do you know somebody who lives by the mantra, if you thought today was bad, just wait until tomorrow. Yeah, you know them, don't you? You <laughs> You know them. Few people enjoy being around folks like that. Why? Because we desperately want to enjoy life. We want to feel contentment. We want to live in the hope of a good day and a brighter tomorrow. New life in Christ is not only a different way to live, but it's also the best way to live. Lifestyle choices and future direction fueled by the reality of divine expectation from a life that is based on nothing but hope. The psalmist said in Psalm 31, 24, Be strong, take heart. All of you who hope in the Lord. Since the rise of Christianity and up to even current day, martyrs, those who die because of their faith in Jesus Christ, like 21 in Egypt just a week ago, martyrs have been a strong segment of encouragement to the population of believers. Why would someone choose to die rather than renounce Christ? All of the apostles 
all of the apostles went through martyrdom. Even John, who died of natural causes, it was only because martyrdom failed on him. They boiled him in oil and he lived through it. Why would all of them choose to die rather than recant their faith? Why would someone suffer torture at the hand of evil dictators because of a belief held in the heart that they would not rescind? Why will people suffer from a lack of food, water, and medical care solely because they are Christians? What drives them to the place their faith is above everything else in their life? And the answer is hope. What else could be the answer? For millions of Christians, the hope of Christ has driven them to survive mind-boggling odds, die peacefully under unspeakable circumstances. The longing to see their Savior on the other side fuels their hearts to endure to the end. When you come to your final day on earth, do you want to face it in fear? Or do you want to confront it with hope? The great news is you can face death with great hope. But the even better news is you don't have to wait until death. You can experience this kind of hope right now in the daily adventure of life. Let's jump on the plane of faith in the sure knowledge of what and who awaits for us on the other side. And in this life, we can echo the words of the psalmist in 33, 20 through 22. We wait in hope for our Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him, our hearts rejoice. For we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in You. I want to take just about five or six more minutes to share with you a threefold encouragement that's available to us out of this passage in Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews 6, in that whole chapter, we are confronted with the profound idea that you and I can have comfort in life from the person whose name is God. The writer of Hebrews brought to our attention the character out of the Old Testament named Abraham, who was given a promise. He was, he was given a command, and with that command, he was given a promise. He said, leave your home. Go to a place I will show you when you get there. That wasn't a weekend trip. It took months and months and years to get there. Then he said, I'll also make you a father with many children and grandchildren and he was an old man with no kids at all. And it was 25 years before God fulfilled that promise. If things appear slow with God, it does not mean that he has forgotten or that he will not perform. Because Abraham is still remembered as the father of faith. Because he patiently waited with hope that he would find the place God had prepared that he would birth the children God had promised and that his seed would become the nation of the Messiah. He had to wait in hope, but God answered. The writer of Hebrews is reminding struggling Christians that Abraham, who was living with much less revelation than you and I have today, Abraham did not have an Old Testament to read yet. It hadn't been written. He was living it. Abraham didn't have a New Testament to read. It hadn't happened yet. Abraham didn't have a church to go to. Abraham had a message from God. Go, when you get there, I'll tell you you've arrived. And that is the reason Abraham is known as the father of faith because with far less revelation than we have, he continued on in faithfulness because he believed in the one who made the promise, God himself, and he makes the difference and he gives us comfort in a troubled world. Second, we have the profound comfort of the promises of God. Not only the person, but the promise. The strength of an oath. God said to Abraham, I swear to you, Abraham, on my name. You see, normally when we swear an oath, we swear an oath by somebody greater than us. In the old days, in a courtroom, you would put your hand on a Bible and you would swear to God. Why? Because He's greater than you are. Well, if you're God, guess what? There's nobody greater than you are to swear an oath. So God said, by who I am, the fact that I am God, I will put my reputation and my character on the line. And in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, God cannot lie. And so this God who cannot lie says, 
I'm making my promise on my character. My promise is as good as I am. Here's the bottom line. You can have complete confidence in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ and His gospel for the God who has promised to save you and to bring you home to heaven swears to it and He cannot lie. And third, we have the profound comfort of the presence of God with us. This hope we have as an anchor to the soul, sure, steadfast. He enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. In the catacombs of ancient Rome, archaeologists have discovered a number of early Christian symbols. One of the early symbols that you could use so that Roman citizens and guards wouldn't necessarily recognize you as a Christian because they were trying to kill them as if you walked along the beach and you thought maybe some you could pause and you could make the symbol of a fish in the sand. When the waves rolled up later, it would wash it away, but somebody else walking by could say, oh, a, a follower of Jesus has been here. And you would find that fish on the walls of the catacombs. Another one of the symbols was the symbol of a shepherd where Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and the shepherd cares for his sheep. The third symbol that you will find in the catacombs representing Christian faith is that of an anchor. Hebrews 6.19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. The catacombs were where the Christians hid from Roman persecution and where they buried their dead. Rather peculiar, isn't it? That a symbol of firm and secure hope would exist in a place of hiding and in a place of death. It's not all that weird when you remember that their hope in the face of persecution and death rested on the memory of an empty tomb and a risen Savior and a king who says, I'm coming again, and ours can rest there too. This passage, this one verse in Hebrews about Hope is an anchor for our soul, describes this anchor of hope in three ways. First of all, it says it's sure. This anchor is sure. It implies our outward safety, that nothing in this world can destroy our life. There is nothing that can topple the believer's hope. Paul had the same idea when he penned the words in Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul says, for I am persuaded Paul, one of the most brilliant men of his day, learned from the brightest teachers of the period. Paul, an antagonist of Christianity initially, who, who by an encounter with Jesus Christ came to faith and put his hope in him. He says this in Romans 8, I am persuaded. What are you persuaded of, Paul? I am persuaded that not death can't, life can't, angels can't principalities of this world can't, powers, things present, things to come. There is nothing so tall, there is nothing so wide, there's nothing, anything that's been created that can separate me from the love of God. That is my hope, Paul said. Is that yours? Is there anything in this world that, that terrifies you so bad that they could snatch you away from God? Paul says, no, it can't happen. It can't happen. We are safe with this anchor of hope. We also find the anchor is not only safe, but it's steadfast. This points to the inward stability of the anchor of hope. The life of Jesus Christ in us is steadfast. There is no weakness in this anchor of hope. We do not have to concern ourselves with hope going bankrupt or encountering a scandal of some sort. It is thoroughly established and firm in the 2,000-year history of the testimony of a risen Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. And the third description of hope as the soul's anchor demonstrates the place where our anchor rests. How many of you are fishermen? You fish some. You fish in a boat some, all right? How many of you have an anchor in your boat? Okay. What do you do with your anchor in the boat when you want to use it? You throw it overboard. Have, and yeah, it's good to tie, yes, it's good to tie. Have, <laughs> sounds like somebody who didn't do that once. <laughs> yeah. Any of you tried throwing your anchor up? That's what God says He does with our anchor. 
You see, you throw an anchor overboard and you drag the muddy bottom until you hope it catches something. Because an anchor can't hold you stable in sand and mud. It moves. This says our anchor is steadfast. It is unmovable. And where does the anchor anchor itself? It says in heaven, where Jesus, our forerunner, has entered for us. Our anchor is not anchored down, it's anchored up. You see, this world, things are always changing and shifting. But Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and where I am, there you may be also. You can take your anchor of hope, and it is locked in. I have taken the anchor up with me when I rose from the dead, and it is steadfast, and it is sure. That's incredible. The anchor of our soul. Let me wrap this up. A brilliant scientist by the name of Michael Faraday was also a profound believer in Jesus Christ. Look him up, Google him, Michael Faraday. When he was dying, some journalist who was not a believer questioned him as to his speculations about life after death. Speculations? I know nothing of speculations, young man. I am resting on the certainties. I know that my Redeemer lives, and because He lives, I live also. Amen. The director of a medical clinic told a terminally ill young man who came in for his usual treatment, a a new doctor who was on duty said to him casually, and I will admit rather cruelly, young man, you know that you won't live out the year. As the young man left, he stopped by the director's desk, and he wept. And he said, that doctor took away my hope. And the director replied, I guess he did, son. Maybe it's time you found a new hope that can't be taken from you. On Friday, February the 12th, five years ago. About 9.30 in the morning. I was by my mom's bedside in the Hines Hospice home. And I was pretty confident that she didn't have 24 more hours to live. I whispered into her ear that morning that I did not want to leave her bedside, that I did not want to go to two funeral services that I had that day. I said, I don't want to go. And with strength I didn't know she had at that moment, and confidence in her eyes, she whispered back to me. She said, son, you go share hope that those folks may not have. We already have more than we need. You see, my mother's cup of hope was running over. And on that day, I needed a little bit of it to spill over on me. It did. It is what David meant when he wrote the 23rd Psalm and he said, My cup is running over. Why, David? Because goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Does your cup run over? (laughs) If not, Mama's cup is still running over. It'll splash on you today. It is Charles Haddon Spurgeon who said on that last verse of Psalm 23, I shall go dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He broke it down out of his original language and he said it's in a present progressive tense. And so he, he explained that this way. He said, David was saying, I am now living in the house of the Lord And when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will simply climb the stairs and live in an upper story of God's dwelling. I'm always in my Father's presence. Do you have that kind of hope today? I don't know why some of you came today. Did you come because you were lacking hope? Did you come looking for hope? I remember one woman who's part of our church, probably 20 years now. 
Late one night, she was driving down the East Avenue. <coughs> Hopeless. The high beams of her car shined on the name of the church. And she saw the two words, new hope. Instead of continuing her journey on with the thought that this might be the last night of her life, she pulled in the parking lot. She sat here for an hour. She said, I will come back on Sunday and see if there really is a call. And she found him. She didn't find a church that could answer the problems. She didn't find a preacher who could meet her needs. She found a Savior whose name is Jesus Christ. And he gives hope to all. Do you need to invite in your heart today? And during this closing prayer, using your own words, why don't you just say, Lord, <coughs> remember me. I need the whole thing <coughs> that was talked about today. I need your son, Jesus Christ. Invite him to come live in your life. Acknowledge to him you can't do life on your own. It's called the fact that sin gets in our way. But he loves us in spite of all of that. Maybe you're here and you're a believer and your tank, your whole tank, just as you might. And why do you say, Lord Jesus, forgive me that I've been distracted by the circumstances of life. And I'm ready to put my attention back on your son, Lord Jesus. That's my Father. <clears throat> Hope is not just a word. Hope is a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, he is the hope of the world. And I trust in the frailty of these human lips. I trust your spirit has been active in our midst today. And waves of hope have been flooding into lives of those who were parched, whose tanks were up empty. Father, maybe somebody came a bit stubborn today. I know your persistence can overcome their stubbornness, and yet you will not override their free will. And so I pray that the man, that woman, who maybe has been so persistent at this moment, will just say, okay, Lord, I'm tired of the fight. I will throw in the towel of being God of my own life, and I am ready to receive all that you are for all that I need. Thank you, God, that you hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, the one who's the anchor to our soul of hope, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.